get started then. Um, welcome to uh, today's topic, which is software, and specifically the title of this talk, Backpacking with Code, Software Portability for Distributed High Throughput Computing. So we've already done a bit with different software programs already, um, but hopefully this talk will um, help give some context, put some of the pieces together, and give you more information that you might need to actually get your own jobs running in um, the Open Science Grid. So what we'll hopefully cover in the next 20 to 30 minutes are some introductory concepts around software, how it works, how it's installed, how it runs, um, mainly so that we have a better foundation for thinking about how to run our software in a distributed high throughput computing setting like the Open Science Grid. Uh, the, certainly myself and my colleagues who support researchers running um, high throughput computing work often refer to making software portable. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that actually means and then um, talk about how to actually do it. What are some of the different ways that we can make our software portable? But before digging into all of these details, I'm going to start with um, an analogy to kind of set the stage for what we're doing. Um, and that is running software on your computer is like cooking something in your own kitchen. So you know what's already there. Um, in the case of your kitchen, you know what food you have. In the case of your computer, you've probably installed all the software you're using because that's how you got started. So you know that everything is there. Um, you know it's there, you know where it is, and you have full control where you can add um, things as you need them, um, when you need them, and make changes. So that's where we're coming from. Um, sort of as part of our normal normal workflows. But as we move to a distributed high throughput computing system where we're using a shared computer, specifically someone else's computer, um, it's a bit like then trying to cook something in someone else's kitchen. Do we know what's already there? Do we know what ingredients they have? Do we know what software they have installed? <laughs> um, if it's there, do we know where it is? And are we allowed to make any changes? Um, you know, your friend probably wouldn't be too happy if you, uh, you know, tore out their dishwasher and put in something else instead. <laughs> um, in the same way, when you're running on someone else's computer, there may be a limit to um, the changes you can make to get your software to run. So how are we gonna deal with this situation? Um, the solution that we recommend whenever possible is to think like you're going camping or backpacking and you need to take everything with you, um, as in this photo, to make a pot of coffee in the wilderness. Um, in the computer side of this analogy, that means taking your software with you, install it almost anywhere so you can run almost anywhere. Um, and when we talk about making software portable, that is what we mean. Okay, so this is our goal to get here it'll be helpful to go over some um, general software concepts um, and how they relate to distributed high throughput computing so that um, we kind of better understand what we actually need to do to achieve this portability goal. So concept number one, software programs are files. Software, the software on your computer is either a single file or a set of files that's all it is, and these files have instructions for the computer to run. So I make this point because it helps us think about um, in the distributed high throughput computing setting, to run our software, we need to have a specific set of files. We need the software files we need to run whatever. Um, we need to know what they are, we need to isolate them and move them along. Okay, related, Here's a sort of very big picture overview of how software works. So I have here uh, a program, 
Um, and the, the words in parentheses are other names that we use um, for the same idea. So they're all meant to be synonyms. Um, so this is the file that I was talking about in the previous example. In this case, I'm doing RStudio is my program. So it's a file somewhere on my computer. And then when I open it, it launches to um, a running program. So it's on my computer, and then it's going to run its own tasks. It might depend on another program, another set of software files I have on my computer, in this case R. As it's running, it's going to be interacting with the operating system. Um, the operating system keeps an eye on the running program, and the running program makes requests via the operating system to use parts of the hardware, the underlying computer. Um, and so the operating system is like a mediator of the running program. So from this diagram, uh, we have the principle that the software you're using to run has to be able to um, interface properly with the operating system on the computer. And it may depend on other programs. And so for us on the Open Science Grid, we got to be able to run on Linux because that's the default operating system. And we need to know if our sort of main software depends on any other pieces. OK, so keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to change direction a little bit now to talking about where software is installed. So this diagram on the left is sort of a schematic of a pretty common Linux file system structure. And the upper folders or directories are typically what are called system locations. That's one place you can put your software files. Um, the bottom two folders there are uh, what we'd call local or user locations. Um, so those are two different places where we could actually put software. Um, but they're distinguished by who can actually install software to those places. The top set, the system locations, you have to be an administrator, typically, to add new things. Um, the bottom folders, owned by a particular user, can usually be accessed by that user, and they can do what they want in that folder. Um, if something is installed in a system location, it's probably accessible by anyone. The user folders um, can definitely be accessed by their owner, maybe other people as well. So, our software files have to be put somewhere in the system. When running on someone else's computer, we've got to be able to do that without being an administrator. And we need to be able to access what, whatever location is picked wherever the software is going. OK. Now, there's different ways to run programs. Often, we run things on our computer using like Windows or a Google. Uh, on our screen or a GUI, a graphic interface. But we want to be able to automate how programs run. And the way to do that, the answer to this question, how to automate programs, is on the slide, <laughs> the command line. Um, to run software in an automated way, we have to use the command line. We have to use text commands. And so to do this in our uh, high throughput system, um, we got to be able to run our software from the command line. Multiple are okay, um, but we can't use a, a GUI or graphical interface to actually run our software. All right, and finally, putting the last two concepts together, if we're going to run on the command line, the, the sort of underlying command line system or a computer needs to know where we installed our software. So again, that lo the location um, in the file system. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do this. You can provide an actual path to the software itself. Um, there's also a common system variable called the path, all caps, um, which contains a list of places where software is installed. And we can add our location to that um, variable and use it. Um, but the overarching principle is that to run our software program on the command line, um, it has to be findable, 
And so when we're in this world of distributed high throughput computing, um, we have a couple different tools that we can use to help make that possible. So in summary, um, in order to make software portable, be able to run anywhere, um, the lessons we've just learned are that we need to bring along the software files that we need. They need to be placed in a location we can access and have some control over. We'll use the command line to run them. To do that, we need to provide the correct location. And this is all going to be happening on Linux. OK, so that's the big picture and some of the concepts and um, details we will need to think about as we're going along. But now let's talk about um, the rest of this talk is mainly going to cover two different ways to achieve what was discussed on the previous slide, how to actually do this. So the first one, we're going to talk ab about really specifically how to um, get the right software files for your job and then use them to run a job. So first, how do we get our software, specifically our software files? Well, maybe you can just download it. Um, the first two exam um, software exercises are using a piece of software that we can just download and run. <laughs> so that's pretty easy. Um, sometimes, be able to download something that works right away or there isn't um, a compiled version of the software already available. So you will have to create your own installation by compiling the software yourself. And this could result in a single binary file that you can then run or a more complex installation that's contained in a single folder. OK, so let's take a step back. When I talk about compiling and source code and what all, what, what do I mean? Um, so this is true for all, again, all software starts out as source code written by humans, readable by humans, and has to get converted into a binary format that the computer can understand. And the process for doing this is called compilation, um, sometimes compilation and linking. And um, this diagram shows how it works, um, not in great deal, but the key pieces. Um, the source code is run through a program called the compiler, um, and which is also sometimes tied to the operating system, and turned into this binary format. As part of that process, um, the source code may use information from pre-existing um, tools on the computer called libraries. And those are linked into the binary, the final binary thing. Um, and then the binary compiled binary object um, is a piece of software that can be run on a computer. Now, when it's run, um, it may still need to refer to the libraries that were originally used when it was created. So often this is fine, but because we want to be able to run anywhere where maybe those libraries don't exist, um, there's a variation of this process um, called static linking, compilation and then static linking, where the compilation process happens. We turn the source code into binary code. But then the information that's needed from the libraries in the code gets bundled together into the final binary file. Um, so that means it has all the information it needs inside that single file so that it can go run anywhere. And so this is also sometimes called a static binary. Um, OK, so that's the process that sometimes needs to happen. If you can't download uh, your software sort of ready to go, pre-compiled or in a binary format, you may have to go through this compilation process. Now, this can happen a couple ways. Sometimes you run the compiler directly, um, and there's some options you can use to control that process. More frequently, you'll see installation instructions where you run something like a configure step. Um, sometimes 
you use CMake for this. And then a make step behind the scenes, that's running the compiler to compile the code. So that's not something you actually have to figure out yourself. You know, the author of the software will have done it for you. And then make install will put the installation together into a particular location. So just keep an eye out for these if you do have to um, compile or build your software yourself. Okay, now this isn't quite the whole picture um, because there's some kinds of programming languages that are not compiled. Um, so instead of being compiled and run, um, lang some languages called interpreted languages are written into like a script and then run through an interpreter that turns them into binary code um, when you basically when you run them. And so what kind of code is this? Programs written in C, C++, and Fortran are usually compiled in that process kind of I was just describing. Um, interpreted languages that are translated on the fly are, are your typical scripting languages like Perl, Python, R, Julia. So in this case, Again, thinking ahead to running on, say, the Open Science Grid, we're not going to compile a Python script, for example. But to run, the Python script needs the Python interpreter. And that is actually a compiled piece of software um, that you need to have in order for the script to run. So that's still there, but kind of at a different. As a side note, <laughs> MATLAB is kind of a weird combination of these approaches. It is a scripting language. And in theory, you could run it in the same way that you would run Python or R, except to do that would require a MATLAB installation on the target computer. And that would also require a license, which would get very, very tricky and possibly impossible <laughs> if you don't have enough licenses. However, there's also a way you can compile MATLAB. Um, the people that produce MATLAB MathWorks have a like specialized MATLAB compiler. So you can compile MATLAB scripts into this special binary format. And then they also provide a runtime, which is kind of like an interpreter um, that you can download for free. And the two of those things together, the compiled MATLAB code and the MATLAB runtime together, um, can execute your particular code. So that's just a, a side note, one of the exercises um, covers this. If you use MATLAB, definitely check it out. Okay, so somehow we have gotten our software files, specifically in a binary format. We've downloaded them, we've compiled them ourselves, we've compiled the interpreter, and we have our scripts. Now we actually want to run a job. So we have two options. If our software is a single binary file, we can put it as the jobs executable. So the, the kind of gray stuff there is meant to be binary format. <laughs> um, and run it that way. So Condor will transfer that binary file and run it for us. We could also, um, with software in any format, use a wrapper script. So that's the blue box at the bottom. In this example, um, it's a bash or shell script um, that unzips a file and then runs something inside of it. Um, so there, the wrapper script, because it wraps up the job, is the executable. And we see in transfer input files some of the software components that the wrapper script is going to um, unpack and then run for us. So in a more diagrammatic form, <laughs> Here's uh, what the workflow would look like if you have a single binary. Um, that is the jobs executable. Compile it yourself or download it. It's on the submit server, and then it gets sent to each execute server to run. Uh, the wrapper script workflow, you have your wrapper script. You have your other software files. Um, all of that is transferred to an execute server, and the wrapper script will kind of help set up uh, the installation, usually that just means unzipping a zipped file, but it can vary, um, and then run your code. So there's two different ways to um, 
actually submit a job that runs using um, the software files that you've collected or put together. So I'm going to pause very briefly here. Um, we've covered our introductory concepts. This past section was about getting your software files and then using them in jobs. So we're going to change direction here a little bit. Um, we're still talking about software portability, but the main change is going to be in how we sort of collect and package up our software files. So before, it was a set of files, maybe in a folder, um, maybe zipped up. This section, we're going to talk about a different way to get together your software files called containers. So containers are a tool for capturing a whole job environment. It's basically a whole Linux file system. So a like little mini Linux computer, <laughs> self-contained, that you have complete control over. Um, so you can put whatever software, libraries, whatever you want in it. And then that container um, comes from what's called the container image, which is like the template. Um, and then that container image can be used to sort of regenerate the container as many times as you want. And when that's done, all the stuff you installed will be inside and accessible to whatever is using it. So to revisit our um, analogy from the beginning, um, if bringing along just your software files is kind of like backpacking, this is a little bit, using a container is a little more like using a camping trailer and bringing along like a whole kitchen <laughs> with you. Um, so still portable, maybe a little slightly less portable than the, the previous solutions we were discussing, um, but you're still kind of bringing along what you need um, to go almost anywhere. So I want to uh, step to the side here and just reflect on why you would use containers. Um, as opposed to the methods I just discussed of compiling or collecting all the files and submitting that way. Um, so there's a couple reasons why a container can be a good choice for um, creating your portable software setup. Um, so one is if the software you're installing is really complex. Um, you have more control and more options in a container um, because it is like almost like a whole com file system slash computer. Um, so uh, if your software has a lot of pieces, sometimes that's really helpful to be able to have that kind of flexibility. Um, some software is really particular about where it's installed. If it has to be installed to a system installation or can't be sort of arbitrarily moved around, um, containers can provide that kind of consistency, which is sometimes necessary. Um, if a group is kind of running a common workflow and wants to have the exact same um, software setup, containers are a good way of doing that because if everyone has the same image, um, all of the containers used will be identical. There won't be any variation. And um, finally, some people use containers as a way to kind of snapshot what they used for a particular project. So if they have to come back to it later, um, they have a copy of what they did. So those are reasons why a container might be a good solution um, instead of um, the more file-based approach that I went through first. Um, to actually use them, some of this is going to be very similar to the file-based approach. You need to either find a container that already exists with what you need in it, or build your own. Um, we're not going to cover building your own container today, but I'm hoping to get together an exercise um, soon-ish um, for those who are interested um, to try it out themselves. So hopefully more coming there. Um, when you use containers, there's two main container kind of systems out there. One is called Docker, and the other is Singularity. Um, for each of them, you can build a Docker container or a Singularity container. 
And then those containers can be run by either like the underlying Docker software or the underlying Singularity software. So sing the Singularity software can run both Docker and Singularity containers. Docker can only run, the Docker software can only run Docker container formats. So um, you'll see sometimes different systems will use Docker versus Singularity to actually run things. Most people, when they build their own containers, build them in the Docker format um, because it's pretty easy to convert them to the Singularity format or run them with Singularity. So you get kind of both, you can use both systems um, if your container itself is in the Docker. If that was confusing or you want to talk more about the differences between the two, definitely hit us up in the software channel of the Slack um, and we can have a longer discussion. So once you have your container, um, you can use it to in your job basically by adding information to the submit file. So again, the difference between Singularity and um, Docker um, will depend, will kind of ch change what you put in your submit file. So we have two examples here. Um, we support Docker from CHDC, so from the Learn submit server. Um, this is what you would use. The Open Science Grid um, submit server, OSG Connect, um, does Singularity. But you'll see that both of these here, you're providing the name of the container image you want to use and any requirements to make sure that you land on a computer that can actually run it for you so it can run your job. So this has Docker for the top one and has Singularity for the bottom. So what that workflow looks like in our diagram here is you'd have whatever script or program you want to run and the name of the container image in your sub file. Um, the container image itself will probably be in some shared location. Um, there's a website called Docker Hub that hosts um, Docker containers. Um, OSG Connect has a space for um, Singularity container images. So when your job starts, the image will get pulled from the appropriate place, started, which kind of turns it into a running container. Your script or program will go inside and execute. So that's what will actually sort of happen. OK, so that is software portability with containers. So a little different than software portability just with files and folders. Um, what the two approaches have in common is you have to either create or find some kind of software setup, either a container or compile your own code or de just download the code. So you've got to have the raw material to work with. Um, then in your submit file, make sure that you either indicate the name of the container or the files that you need to run, any special requirements needed by your software, whatever it's using. And in certain cases, you'll also have to write a wrapper script um, to help do some of the work of setting up um, the software environment when the job runs. So kind of that is the process for software portability uh, in a nutshell. And we've sort of seen two ways to approach it through software files or through containers. So finally, um, if a, soft, a more portable approach won't work, sometimes there's the possibility of using pre-installed software where your job lands on a computer and um, this would be kind of like going to a friend's house and you assume that they have the right things in their kitchen. Um, you land on a computer and you kind of assume that the software you need is already there. So um, the idea is to bring it along yourself because it will give you the most flexibility. Um, but you can use pre-existing installations. Um, the is knowing that the software is there and that you can access it. So in when submitting from OG Connect, login 04 or 05 for most of you, um, 
there's a shared software repository um, maintained by that team available across um, sites in the OSG. Um, and so this is possible at a certain scale, um, and you can use um, module command to um, kind of access and load the software. So um, the modules are sort of originate at the, at the login points, which happen to be in China, and then are available not on all, but on some uh, OSG across the country. And so uh, you can see what's available by running little commands on the OSG Connect submit servers. Um, you can load those modules um, and use them to run commands. So to actually use the modules in a job, you find a module, you write a wrapper script that loads it, you do one of the commands from the previous slide, um, then runs your code. Um, and then most importantly, your submit file needs to have a requirement to make sure you only um, run on computers that have the modules available, the software modules available to them. So um, you'll have some kind of wrapper script um, that loads the module and runs your code um, and a requirement statement. And see here, our job can run on the first two servers because the modules are there. And so the wrapper script loads and runs. Won't run on the third server because there are no modules. Um, so that's what that overall workflow looks like. Um, okay, I think that's all I have. I will stop sharing. Um, and 